You like that? Welcome, welcome to the trial of Jesus, a lawyer's perspective with lawyer Ace Ankuma, one of Ghana's most respected lawyers, will be looking at the trial of Jesus from a contemporary perspective, just to help us learn lessons and also help us uh, build our Christian faith. It's gone. Also help us build our Christian faith. Okay, fantastic. Having a few technical challenges, but we are fine. Good. Over 2,000 years ago, a 33-year-old man who claimed to be the son of God, but people knew him as the son of a carpenter. His claims and religious beliefs stirred up controversies. His preachings challenged the traditional notions about God and the worship of God. The religious, the established religious institutions felt threatened. They gathered witnesses against him and orchestrated his arrest. He was arrested, tried, convicted, and sentenced to death by crucifixion. 2,000 years on, lawyer A. Sankoma is going to tell us whether the trial was fair. And if Jesus was tried today, would he have been crucified? Or would he have been found guilty? Lawyer Aysen, come on, welcome to the trial of Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Osofo. You are giving me a, a difficult task. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's going to be a little bit difficult one for me because I'm going to ask you legal questions from a very, yes. from a very non-legal brain. Um, legally, I'm, I'm quite illiterate. Uh, my daughter is studying law, and most of the times we try to do a few uh, discussions on law, and it feels my ideas are not admissible at all in court. But I'll be trying well, to... I, 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 actually, even my kids who are studying law find me a bit old where the law is concerned, so, so I understand your situation. Amazing, amazing. Amazing. So Leah, come on, just tell us a little about your Christian journey, how you got born again, and how uh, your work up to this point before we go on. Well, to the it's, a, it's a long checker journey um, of, of, of struggling to, 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 to match up to the standards of the Lord Christ. Um, I became associated with the born again phenomenon exactly on 6th March 1980 when I was just uh, an 11 year old, um, essentially being pulled along by a joyful way because I could play the keyboard. Um, for, the, for the first part, not knowing exactly what I was about, but just following them and playing the keyboard. And so that is that has been the journey. I, I A lot of my, my work has been with joyful way, with the, with the music, part, music part of joyful way. I served as music director for six or eight years, I forget. And then I, um, I, I think six years. And then I, no, total of eight. <laughs> and then I wrote a lot of their songs, played at a lot of their programs. My church, Covenant Family Community uh, Chapel, formerly Soul Clinic, is where I've done a lot of a, a lot of the work um, for the body. Apart from behind the scenes, working with people like you um, to, 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 to advance the work. That's, that's a brief description of my journey. Amazing, amazing, amazing. I, you still play the guitars. I... Sometimes I, I watched yes. like two years ago, Joyful Way, um, Ways events, and I could see you at the back there still playing the, the guitars. But most people... Yeah, I, I, I used to go. I used to go and play with them from time to time, but now I've, I think I've formally retired. I mean, my kids are now playing with Joyful Way, <laughs> and, 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 and they call me grandpa. <laughs> you know, so I think I've become, I've become a tad too old. Um, oh. But I still play. I still, you know, I, I still record. I still uh, consult on their albums. 
if I need to go to the studio, I will go to the studio to play. In fact, I shall have been in the studio this morning working on one of their songs, but for the fact that I have, I, I have to come to Lome. Next week, Saturday at 1 p.m., I'm in the studio with them, arranging and putting producing one of their songs that, that, um, that they've asked for my help with. I still produce a lot of my own music. Um, I'm doing two albums at the same time with different artists and different producers. So I'm still a bit in the flow, but the full-time stage work, Joyful is at... At some villages right now, they have some, they have crusades, socially distanced crusades on, 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 on today. But here I am in Lome because other responsibilities call up. So the days when I could be on stage with them um, are, are kind of over, but I'm still helping very much qualitatively, so often from the background and still playing. So you might hear a joyful song, my guitar work might still be in it, but I'm not really on stage um, the full time with, as, as I used to be previously. I think I should host you on a, on a gospel jazz night with Ace and Common. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank, uh, you for, rusty, but... thank you for making time to join us um, all the way from, from Lome. Um, I guess you're on holidays with your family and uh, you've made a time to, to speak to yes, us. Yes, my, 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 my wife lives and works here. So from time to time, we, 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 we either bought a flight or cross the, cross the border. To come to, to come to Lome. Amazing, amazing, fantastic, fantastic. Good. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus was 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 convicted on two charges: um, inciting rebellion against the state, which of course I assume Pontius Pilate would have that interest. And then he was also charged with blasphemy, which I guess was under Herod and uh, what was the legal environment like at the time of Jesus? Well, you, you, are, you, you have a spot on. Israel had been conquered by Rome and Rome did a bit of direct rule and indirect rule. And so they'll send in prelates, pilots and others to govern the conquered territories. But they also allowed those, they did not completely Romanize the territories. For example, for some of these territories, they didn't ship the Roman gods to those territories and demand that everybody says them. And so you'd have two parallel legal systems, one that recognized the customs and existing laws of the conquered territories, and another that recognized the role and rule of Rome. And this is where Israel found itself. So the rabbinical courts, the Sanhedrin, existed to try the religious wrongs, um, blasphemy, etc. Basically, the, 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 the law, the, the, the Talmudic law. And so the, the offices of the Pharisees and Sadducees and everybody were, were, were respected. And they could even put to death. Then there was a secular um, legal system, which people like Pilate, who had oversight authority, but there was still a king of Galilee, Herod, could exercise. And that is where issues like robbery, um, stealing, um, uh, treason, rebellion would be tried. So you have two parallel systems operating at, at the same time. And that is at the heart of the dilemma that Jesus found himself in. That was a difficult situation for a 33-year-old man who had the state against him and the religious elite against him. Could it have you are right. Yeah. Go Sorry. ahead. Please. Go ahead. No, I'll, I'll just say that you are right. Okay, so he has to be tossed between these two giants, um, two jurisdictions. And uh, I guess it was a very difficult thing, especially when he had no lawyer. Did he choose to represent himself or that was how cases were handled at the time? I, I haven't read that at the time you could have legal representation. Yeah, there, were, there were people who were learned in, learned, learned in the law, there were people who were regarded as lawyers. But I have looked at a lot of trials around the time and I, have, I don't recall seeing that anybody had legal representation the way we had it now. But let me throw in some caveats before we move on. Mm. This is for the most part an intellectual exercise. What mm. I've done is to review the facts of a matter 20 centuries apart. Mm. The same standards obviously did not apply at the time, the standards of today. 
And two, let me add another caveat. I try very hard to humanize the characters and events mm -hmm. to present pictures of human beings like all of us, not a bunch of spirits or saints. Yeah. Now, the other difficulty in analyzing the script, so essentially I'm doing a legal analysis of a trial script as if it's court records. The difference is that there are, there are differences in sequential and factual presentation in the four books. So I have selected John's script as my core text, and I introduce aspects from the synoptics to give as full a picture as possible. So I don't want to cover all the facts because the facts, are, I mean, if I did that, we won't close. And I forgot to ask how long we have. So forgive me if your favorite fact does not feature in the analysis, but this is a caveat that I think I need to do. But so far, I forgot to ask, how long do we have for this presentation? Uh, 45 minutes. Oh, yes. then let's get straight to work. Let's get so straight. I, want us to, I first want us to tackle, there were pre-arrest and arrest issues, mm -hmm. which were very relevant for the trial. Mm -hmm. Now, I think, I'll, I'll suggest to you, that probably there's evidence to suggest that Jesus provoked his arrest and trial. Mm -hmm. Now that can show who will that provoke obvious death. Well, there was one the social provocation in John 11, where Jesus had gone to raise Lazarus from the dead in Bethany. Mm -hmm. He made a public show, and Bethany was just it's just across the hill from Jerusalem. It was a public show. He went four days after the death and rose this guy from the dead, and the news spread. This caused fear among the, the priests and Pharisees because they said it might invite unnecessary attention from Rome. And so they plotted to kill him. And the plot was so real that the Bible records that Jesus went into hiding. Mm -hmm. And they issued a death by all means threat, even against Lazarus. So they wanted to kill Jesus and Lazarus. So there was a social provocation by raising Lazarus in such a public way and waiting four days after the man had died so that there could be no rabbinical interpretation of that, that this is just a mistake in terms. He, the, uh, the, 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 the authorities felt socially provoked. There was also the political provocation. And if you look at John, then we do, this Lazarus event is in John 11. Then John tells us in 12, that when Jesus had provoked this and had gone into hiding, on Sunday, he shows up in the triumphant entry into Jerusalem where the crowds welcomed him and said, blessed is the name of he who comes in the name of the Lord. I call this the political provocation. So he for them, and I'm looking at this. He didn't need a Sorry. permit. <laughs> no, 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 he didn't ask for their permit. In fact, even, even the donkey he used was borrowed. That's right. But he entered in to loud acclaim. And so the powers at the time felt a political provocation. This was in their face. Now, Mark then records that and immediately after this, Jesus went into the temple and whipped the money changers and those who were selling. Financial provocation. Now you provoke me socially, politically, and now you are sticking your finger into my money. So into my eyes. Thank you very much. Upsetting the economy. And so there were three, uh, the, uh, from the perspective of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the religious class, he had provoked them socially politically, and worse of all, financially touching their pockets. But there's also the Judas factor that we must address also. And permit me, I'm going to look at a bit of this from Judas's perspective. And we have this from Judas' perspective because we consider him so bad that although his name, um, Judas, is a very good name, praise, I'm, I'm yet to meet anybody called Judas. I've seen Judah, my, my nephew is Judah. I've, seen, I've heard Jude, I, heard, I hardly hear Judas. Now, Yes, Judas had issues with fidelity, especially with money. Hmm. But is it possible there was at least an additional factor? Did he probably lose his faith in Jesus as the Messiah? Now, look at the issue of the woman with the alabaster box. Think of this very closely, if you are listening to me. This woman gets crashed a hangout by Simon in Bethany, the town where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. That is where this party was taking place. Matthew calls Simon the leper. But Simon could not be, have been a leper at that time because he would have been unclean and out of the camp. So even if he was a leper, then he must have been healed. By whom? We don't know if it was Jesus. Now, so, but 
Luke calls him Simon the Pharisee. Amazing. He was a holy man of the religious class. I wonder whether he was at the trial of Jesus. And Luke calls the woman with the alabaster box a sinner. So there's little doubt what Luke means by a sinner. If a woman is called a sinner in the Bible, there's a 99% chance that the person is being accused of sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. And so this woman, suspicious woman, comes into the house of a Pharisee to hang out with Jesus. Now you can imagine that people in the uh, garden, including the disciples, would be a bit uncomfortable. And then something happens. An extremely intimate worship where this woman, possibly of doubtful character, kneels at Jesus' feet, produces sufficient tears to wet his feet, gets into the intimacy of wiping his feet with her hair, and then applying expensive oil. Please, if the woman was a sinner, suspiciously an immoral person, where did she get the money to buy the expensive oil from? Now, for someone like Judas, wait a second, Jesus, I, I, this, there's something wrong with this picture. This woman is way too intimate with you. And I remember the well at Samaria. We went to buy Kenke and came back to find you hanging with a woman of doubtful character. And you use her to evangelize instead of us. And then another time, they brought a woman who had been caught alone in adultery to you. Yes, the woman was committing the adultery alone because she was brought to Jesus to be stoned. And whoever she was with probably wasn't part, was, was asked to go home and, and sin no more. And what did Jesus do? He allows her to go away. And now we have this intimate worship. So remember that Judas immediately complained, but he complained about the cost of the oil. Could he have been implying? Where did she get the money to purchase the oil from? Her sins? What does Jesus do? Jesus reprimands him. In the very next verse, according to Matthew, Judas went to the priest to betray Jesus. So he might have had his problems, but there appears to be, of course, this is what they call the, the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy. The fact that it appears, it happens after, doesn't mean before cause after. But it is suggestive that it might have been the immediate push. He agrees to sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. According to Dix, that's only the equivalent of $20 today. The cost of a slave, according to Exodus 21, but enough to buy a plot of land. Then there are questions, where did the disciples disappear to? I'm suggesting to you that from the perspective of the disciples, they also got disappointed. They had had the last supper. Jesus had told them of his death. They sort of understood it. Then he told them that you are about to be offended because of me. What did he mean by that? And when he said that, Peter, based on his newfound faith, said, I'm pledging my undying loyalty. Jesus bluntly shoots him down and says, you, your loyalty won't last a, a, a night time before three uh, uh, cock crows. The Bible records that Peter and the disciples vehemently affirmed and reaffirmed their loyalty. When they get to Gethsemane, Jesus selects three to go ahead with him. Who are the three? Peter, of course, and then the sons of Zebedee. These same sons who had argued as to who will sit at the right and left hand side of Christ. So if I, these are your last days and you take Peter, our obvious leader, then you choose John and James to go ahead with you. When, what did they go and do? They even went to sleep. So he leaves the eight because by that time, um, 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 uh, Judas is leading the crowd. When Judas appears and betrays him with a kiss, the disciples attempted to fight to prove their loyalty. Peter slashed Malchus's ear. Jesus didn't just heal Malchus. He rebuked the disciples for wanting to fight. And the Bible records that they immediately forsook him and fled. They forsook him. So now he, his, his prophecy was right. Actually, he had offended them and they left. It's against this background that Jesus now is taken for the trial. And I thought we should set this as a background. And, I'm, and like I said, I'm looking at a lot of these, maybe not even from Jesus' perspective, but from the perspective of the human beings who operated with them, that the disciples fled, they were angry. And Judah might have felt wrongly justified in going there to sell him for just 30 pieces of silver, the cost of one plot of land. But also if we move on to the trial because that's why we are here. Two backgrounds. One, both Isaiah 53 and Act 8 confirmed that Jesus would be unjustly condemned, which meant that he was going to go without a fair trial. And so we must have this at the back of our mind. 
that it had been prophesied that the trial would be unjust and unfair. And two, we pointed to the two systems of law that operated at the time. Now, when Jesus is arrested, the first stop, where did they take him to? To a private interrogation by Annas, in the house of Annas. Who was Annas? He was a former high priest, so he really had no position. His most recent position was that he was the father-in-law of the current high priest, Caiaphas. The reason was that at this time, high priesthood was no longer for life. Rome and or Herod was appointed high priest. But for whatever happened in Annas's house, he then bound Jesus and delivered him to Caiaphas's house for trial by the Sanhedrin. So that was the second stop. Trial at a person's private home. The Sanhedrin didn't have premises to try people at. Now, we must look at the character of Caiaphas. He was irretrievably conflicted. One, he was not an impartial judge. This arrest had come through his father-in-law to him. And he was presiding over the life of a person he had already condemned. Because John confirms that earlier, Caiaphas had suggested that they should kill Jesus. A man who had said, let's kill him, was, one the one, was now the one who was going to try him under which first system. And in fact, he had even cautioned that let's not arrest him on a feast day because it could lead to riots. This time he had forgotten. He had also forgotten that under his rabbinical law, no judgment could be executed on the eve of a Sabbath or eve of any festival. He forgot all of that. Then the trial begins before the Sanhedrin. Jesus is charged with blasphemy, but supported by perjury. False testimony, which under Deuteronomy 19 should not have been admitted. Caiaphas' questions to Jesus were twofold. By whose authority have you, one, formed a sect of disciples? It means that he, had, he considered him a sectarian. He had taken three, 12, 70, and probably more away from the known sects of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and others who acknowledge and formed his own sect. By whose authority? Essentially, you have challenged my authority as a high priest. Two, who gave you the power to preach the doctrine you are preaching, the reform doctrine that you are preaching? Now, Jesus' answer, <laughs> when I said I tried to humanize this as much as possible, yeah. was philosophical yeah. and evasive, effectively challenging the Sanhedrin to produce credible witnesses. He said, I have preached in the synagogue, temple, and all Jewish gatherings, and not in secret. If you, Caiaphas, have not heard me, others have heard me. They know what I have said. Ask them. So this 33-year-old boy was not shy at all. He challenged him, said, I have preached everywhere. Bring the, the people who have heard me to come and say whether I have formed an illegal sect or I'm preaching a doctrine that is not known to the scripture. Hmm. Caiaphas hmm. does something that is amazing. He's so angry, he tears off his own clothes. By his own law, that should have disqualified him immediately because Leviticus shows, 21 and 10, that the high priest shall not tear off his clothes, else he will die and wrath will come upon the people. Caiaphas didn't die instantly, but he should have been prohibited from continuing to sit in the trial. In today, a judge will be said to have descended into the arena of conflict. If he gets to the level where he, he tears his clothes in anger because an answer has been given, because judges are supposed to maintain what is called a judicial demeanor, where in spite of what happens, you are elevated above the conflict so you can give as much as possible an impartial judgment. But here is a judge who is so angry that he tears his clothes off. If he did that in any judicial system today, not only will he be removed from the trial, he will be sacked as a judge. The next thing was that an officer slapped Jesus for giving the answer. That cannot happen today. Well, we know that it might happen in the police station, but definitely not in court. An officer who slaps an accused person in court is going to go to jail himself. But Jesus is not protected by the slap. He still demands witnesses and then protests at the violation of his rights. He says, if I've done evil, produce witnesses. If I've done right, why are you assaulting me? The man Jesus knew his rights. He was only 33, but he was not shy. But that was the end. The Sahendrin found him guilty of blasphemy based on the suborned perjury, the lies that they had heard. But wait, Sahindrin, please, was Simon the leper on the Sahindrin that is alleged to have unanimously found him guilty? 
Where was Nicodemus? Had he died in less than three years? And certainly Luke 23 shows that Joseph disagreed with what was happening at the Sanhedrin. But the Sanhedrin report is presented as a unanimous decision. Or was it that some people who were suspected were not invited? So this, these proceedings took place behind their backs. Now, was it not the same Sanhedrin whose members had bribed Judas and knew the arrest was about to take place and so were sitting waiting for Christ to be brought for trial? At the very least, the entire Sanhedrin should have been disqualified because they had sold their hands, they had engaged in bribery, they had suborned perjury, the high priest had conflict, was conflicted. Essentially, if it were today, that whole trial would be set aside by a superior court on an order called certiorari, which is that we should quash the proceedings because the process leading to the conclusion was completely soiled. The root was soiled, the stem was soiled, the branches were poisoned, the fruit would be poisoned. But that was not to end. The third stop was the Praetorium, the Hall of Judgment, Pilate's house. Now, Pilate appears to be taken by surprise. He asks, what's the charge? The answer he receives is that if he wasn't an evil man, we would not have brought him to you. What kind of answer is that? Essentially, they have found Jesus guilty under Jewish law, blasphemy. He had threatened to pull the temple down and rebuild it. That must be an evil person. If, because the only thing that could pull the temple down apart from war was an earthquake. If he could walk on the sea by magic, then he surely would have the magical power to command an earthquake. But if Jesus was guilty of blasphemy and Leviticus 24 said people like that should be stoned, and indeed Stephen had been stoned in Acts 6, if you look at 6, there's trial in 6 and, and Acts 7. Why are they asking Pilate to try him under Pilate's law? You have your law, you have convicted him of blasphemy, go ahead and stone him. Why do they bring him to Pilate and say, now you try him under the secular law? And when Pilate says, why should I try him? They say, it is not lawful for us to put him to death. Wait, that's not true. That's a lie. In John 8, they are taking the woman caught in adultery to Jesus for stoning. In the same chapter, they are trying to stone Jesus, but he escaped. They later stoned Stephen. Was Pilate new or some kind of dummy for to have believed them that they can't stone? Or what they meant was that if we try now, the people will fight us. We want you to do it. And two, because it's on the eve of a feast, we can't execute him. You do it. Essentially, they were passing their sin on to Pilate for Pilate to adopt and, and execute from the perspective of the Romans so that they can control the people. Oh yeah. Was it not now, because Jesus was so good? Was, was it not because Jesus was absolutely. so good? If they have stoned him themselves, they they. There would have been a huge backlash. Absolutely. The man had just raised someone from the dead, irrefutably. There was absolute unchallengeable evidence that he had raised someone from the dead. He had written, he'd written to Jerusalem, and <clears throat> the people had cheered him. And it was the same people. So you are right. They knew they would be in trouble. They had to pass the buck to Pilate. And they had Jesus. They couldn't wait for one or two more days because anything could happen. So they had to trick Pilate to try him under Pilate's law and says, we have found him guilty of blasphemy, but we can't kill him, which was a lie. They could have. But based on this information, Pilate's trial starts yet another trial of Jesus. So he's been tried and convicted, but it's as if the Jews themselves had wiped away that conviction and had now brought him to Pilate. So Pilate starts another trial. And this time, under Roman law, so he, and what offense? Treason, rebellion. So he asks, are you the king of the Jews? A yes would have been, that's it. He had challenged Herod and Rome. Treason, nice, clean, executed, crucified. End of story. But Jesus' answer, whoa. I mean, as well, uh, I sometimes pride myself with having quick um, responses. But Jesus was a master of sarcasm. What? He says, if you are alleging that I am the king, then you prove that I'm the king. What? The burden of proof is on you. Today we'll say produce, produce evidence, the proof, and, and the burden of producing evidence to prove your charges beyond reasonable doubt. You are he alleged. asked Pilate, uh, yeah, you are alleged, you prove I'm the king of the Jews. He asked Pilate, have you heard me say it? And can you produce a single witness 
who has said that I have claimed to be king of the Jews? Unless you can produce that, you don't have a case. Strike one for Jesus. Pilate is confused. Look at Pilate's pathetic response. Am I a Jew? How am I to know? Your own people have brought you here. Okay, what have you done? Unbelievable. What the man on trial is supposed to tell you what he has done. But Jesus had a response. He says, I indeed have a kingdom, but it is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, now please watch why he probably deliberately offended his disciples. He told Pilate that if my kingdom was of this world, my servants would have fought and prevented my arrest and trial. Essentially, I am before you because I do not have a physical kingdom. This is probably why he stopped them at the slashing of the ear, healed the ear, and offended them for them to forsake him and flee. So in other words, he says, Dear Pilate, do not feel threatened for Rome. I do not seek an earthly political kingdom. And, well, if I add, at least not yet. Strike two for Jesus. Pilate is frustrated. He says, all right, if you are not an earthly king, are you any kind of king? <laughs> if you are not an earthly king of the Jews, are you any kind of king? Jesus says, you are the one saying it. Yes, I was born to be a king, but I came to bear witness of the truth. And I came to bear witness of the truth. All who are in the truth hear and obey me. Exasperated, Pilate waxes rhetorical. So what is the truth? Strike three for Jesus. The three charges had all fallen flat. So Pilate announces to the Jews, this man is not guilty. Mm -hmm. And that should have ended the story. He says, I find no fault in him, at least not under my law. You can take him and do what you want to do with him. Me, I can't. Now, they know that they can't stone him on the feast day. And if they wait for the day after the feast, there's no way they can, they can succeed. But Pilate then opens a door, an unnecessary door. He says, well, to pacify you in accordance with your custom before a feast where I exercise clemency, let me release this king of the Jews to you. Now, at this time, Pilate starts teasing the Jews. He calls him king of the Jews. This obviously infuriated them, but they had an already prepared answer. They said, give us Barabbas. Wait a second. Barabbas was a robber who had been arrested, tried, convicted, sentenced to die with two others by crucifixion. Yes, that was the one, yes, that was the one the Jews wanted. Now, he must have been well connected. They wanted a harmless Messiah killed in exchange for a convicted robber. Now, a robber is not just a thief. Oh. By law, he's a thief who steals with the force of arms. That is who they preferred between Jesus, who raised the dead, and Barabbas, a convicted robber. The choice was for the robber. Now, this went on when Jesus was still not guilty, at least under Roman law. He was being held because the Jews had, had, had opted for a, a Messiah thief swap. So in an attempt to please the, the Jews, Pilate then had Jesus whipped. Whipped. He said he's not guilty. Yet he had him whipped, which is something the Romans would do before they crucify you. But Pilate, Pilate still didn't want to crucify the man that he had found not guilty. And he thought the whipping would satisfy the Jews. He was wrong. So Jesus had to undergo another trial because according to Matthew, at this time, Pilate discovered that Jesus was called a Galilean. So he sent him off to Herod, king of Galilee. So at this point, Jesus was not guilty, according to Pilate's law. And that clearly the, the Jews... That is the state law, isn't it? The state law. And the Jews, by bringing him to Pilate, had essentially forsaken their own trial and conviction of him. So my submission, my submission is that as at that time, both under the, the rabbinical law and the state law, Jesus was not guilty. So they sent him to Herod. But Herod was a clown. Herod said he had heard Jesus was performing miracles. So instead of trying the matter, he started teasing Jesus, do a miracle and let me see. Jesus answers him with nothing. He was just silent. Now, there's something else about call, calling Jesus a Galilean, man of Galilee, but really, he was not from Galilee. His parents were from Judea. They lived in Nazareth of Galilee. But you recall that they had to go to Bethlehem for the um, Caesar Augustus census. So he was actually from Judea, but he, he was raised and grew up in Galilee and obviously began his ministry in that area. Now, and 
Almost all his disciples were Galileans, except one, Judas. As for Judas, he was Jesus' homeboy. He was his Ophian, he was his Nyebro, his treasurer, who was now $20 richer on Jesus' account. So Herod engages in this sham trial or investigation, taunting Jesus, and Jesus says nothing. Herod makes no progress, so he returns Jesus to Pilate in the robe of a king. Some jokes are expensive. But this expensive joke somehow healed a long broken relationship between Herod and Pilate. So fifth stop, this is the fifth attempt to try him. This time it is a broken robe, thorn crown Jesus that Pilate presents to the Jews with yet another verdict, not guilty. He said, behold the man. Essentially, if you like, take him and Barabbas and get out of my hair. But the Jews would have none of that. They still wanted crucifixion. Pilate then says, crucify him yourself. He is not guilty according to Roman law. He's not in a position at this time to disclose his wife's dream and caution. But Pilate underestimated the Jews. They had an ace up their sleeve that Pilate had not anticipated. So they said to him, he may not be guilty under, under your law, but he is guilty under our law for another offense that we haven't disclosed. He declared himself the son of God. Now, you might think that this simply takes us to John 5, 18, where they are sought to kill him because they said by calling God his father, he made himself equal to God. That was blasphemy. But remember, Pilate did not have the power to try for blasphemy. But the term son of God struck a chord with Pilate that often people do not, are not aware, or aware of. Now, in ancient Rome, the Caesars did not necessarily succeed by death. It's not by birth, as if your father dies and becomes Caesar. No. Often they fought for the position. Often the, the, the new Caesar was elected. Augustus, who was Caesar when Christ had born, had become Caesar after a bitter civil war when, Julius, when Caesar Julius died against Mark Antony. And for those of you who did um, literature and have read Julius Caesar, Look at the link with the Bible. Julius Caesar died, and that fight between Augustus and Mark Antony was what Augustus won in the war that you see in, in, in the book captured by Shakespeare. And Caesar Augustus became emperor, and he was emperor at the time Jesus was born. But Augustus, knowing how he had become Caesar, knew that he had to become important, else a stronger person would remove him. So he started the system exploiting the superstitious nature of the Romans and evolved into a God designation, evolved a God designation for a living emperor. And a deceased emperor will be deemed worthy of honor and voted to a state of, div uh, of divinity through what they call divination or deification. They call the act of apotheosis. So when Augustus died, Tiberius, who was now the Caesar, became Caesar. No, when Caesar, let, let me go back. When Julius Caesar died and Augustus Caesar became Caesar, a comet, the highest comet, passed over Rome. Augustus took advantage and said that that was the spirit of Caesar, Julius Caesar, entering heaven. And so his predecessor, Julius, had become a god. If he was a god, then he, Augustus, as his successor, was the son of God. Okay. So when the the, when, when the Jewish leaders invoked the son of God, it struck a chord with Pilate that if Augustus was the son of God, then there's a problem here. Now, at his death in AD 14, Tiberius declared Augustus, who was a stepfather and adopted father, a god, paving way for Tiberius to become the new son of God. Let me make it worse. When Jesus said in Matthew 28, show me a coin, that coin bore the head of Tiberius. And this was the inscription on the coin. Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. Augustus, son of the divine Augustus. So even by this, Tiberius was the son of the god Augustus. Yes, history shows that later Tiberius himself wrestled with this concept and didn't want to be called worship the living god. But after his time, the Caesars became deities that were worshiped. And so the son of God statement threw 
um, um, pilot into a country. Here is Tends to the room, and this time she sat in the judgment seat and he asked Jesus, From what is your origin? She's exasperated. He needs Christ, help me release you. He says, Don't you know that I can crucify or release you? Jesus says, You know what? Stop kidding yourself. You have no power except that which is given to you from above. And for this reason, those who delivered me to you have a greater sin. You are about to commit a sin in, in essence, but those who brought me to you have a greater sin. Yet Pilate decides to release him again. This man had been acquitted almost 10 times over. But the Jews, having gotten this close to having Jesus crucified, were smelling blood. The ace had worked, but they had more aces up their sleeve. If you play cards, it's a sport for four of a kind, the quad, all four aces. And so they played them. And they told, they told Pilate, if you release him, then you are disloyal to Caesar. Because anyone who makes himself a king rebels against the emperor whose representative you are. If you release him, you are, you, uh, Pilate, are rebellious against your king. Note, the offense are now changed back to the secular offense of treason. Pilate is compelled to issue a final judgment. He has been differing, he has been uncertain, and this was the sixth hour, it was midnight. So this is how he convicts Jesus. He declares him king of the Jews and leaves it at that. He had made a finding that notwithstanding having no evidence of treasonable conduct whatsoever, he was declaring Jesus king for fear that he would be reported to Caesar. He proclaimed Jesus king to have him executed. Pilate was no different from the Jews. He had missed the ball. How could the, 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 the Jews suddenly become loyal to Caesar? Because when he said, away with him, go and crucify him, should they ask, should I crucify your king? The Jews answered, we have no king but Caesar. That was a warning to Pilate that we are more loyal to Caesar than you. If you don't kill this man, Caesar is going to hear of it. Whatever they could say to have Jesus crucified. Pilate surrenders to the pressure, intimidation, blackmail, subterfuge, thinking only of himself. This is just one man. Let me get rid of him so I can continue to be in Caesar's good books. I don't want to lose my position. I don't want to face trial in Rome for not yielding and executing a rebel who had been proclaimed king of the, uh, the Jews, a direct challenge to the emperor of Rome, even if he himself had never said so. All of this was concocted. The fact that it was concocted was no longer relevant because Pilate had decreed that he was a king. He didn't need any lying witnesses. He had become his own lying witness. He and the Jewish leaders were now singing from the same sing uh, hymn sheet, conspiring, agreeing to work together for a common purpose to kill Jesus. Pilate now had skin in the game, and he had to protect his own skin. He delivered Jesus to be crucified, but he needed further justification also for, and this is the interesting part, because he had, he, to justify his murderous cowardice and dastardly acts, he had to satisfy his own lack of conscience and fortitude. And so as if to convince the army that they were acting in the interest of Rome, Pilate himself, according to John, wrote the words. Now what these words? Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Pilate wrote them himself and stuck it on the cross himself, according to John. Now, this was important because if the news reached Caesar, Pilate would get protection. So look at what Caesar did. He wrote it in three languages. He wrote it in Hebrew for the Jews to read, in Greek for the learned and the lawyers at the time to read, and in Latin for the Romans to read and understand. This way, his message of loyalty to Caesar would travel even faster. At this stage, Caiaphas wanted something else. He wanted the inscription changed to the man who claimed to be king of Jews. He wanted to bring it back into blasphemy. But at this time, Pilate discovered a little testicular fortitude and says, what I have written is written. Because under Roman law, he could not change the terms of the conviction once it's been passed. Christ was guilty of treason. The Jews wanted something that looked and sounded like blasphemy. Pilate was having none of that. So it is at this point that Pilate must have washed his hands and proclaimed vacuously that he was innocent of Christ's blood. And the Jews saying, well, let his blood be upon us and our children. But Pilate could not proclaim himself uh, not guilty because he had participated in this offense. Also, so this is my legal review of it, that several times over, the, the man was proclaimed not guilty. Had it been today, the first not guilty uh, plea would have released him because we have something called autrefois acquis that a man cannot be tried or punished twice 
for the same offense or series of related offenses. If you're trying him, you put everything on board and you try him once. Once he's acquitted, he cannot be tried again for the same offense. So from the first time that Pilate proclaimed him not guilty, had it been today, he should have released him. But Pilate allowed political pressure and his own ambitions and fear of, of the Jews and of Rome to allow him to do all of this. He proclaimed him not guilty again, sent him to another court, which couldn't find him guilty, brought him back, could not find him guilty until he was effectively told, if you don't kill this man, we'll report you to Caesar. And that is what ultimately led to Christ being executed for treason. I have spent a lot of time going into the, the execution process and what crucifixion actually did to the body. But that is clearly out of the perspective. So this is the presentation. And so now I'll take more of your questions so we can engage some more. Amazing. What okay. questions again will I ask? Because you answered all my questions. Amazing analysis. Okay. I, knew, I knew when I asked you to join me for these discussions, you were going to blow our minds. And um, reading this, um, um, comments on Facebook, you have done exactly that. Um, well, thank you. Quickly, the, the Judas's analysis about the fact that he had a weakness and he mm -hmm. allowed uh, things around Jesus to feed into his weakness to sell Jesus. And then um, we come to the numerous acquittals that Jesus had, and yet because these people were eager to have him crucified, they still did. But that also confirmed the fact that God is always looking for a perfect lamp, isn't it? A lamp without blemish. And it was clearly stated throughout the trial that the man was not guilty. And yet they crucified him. And that was because God wanted a perfect lamp, a lamp without blemish. An amazing analysis of, of, of the presentation. But a quick question. Okay. Yes, sir. No, 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 I'm, I'm waiting for the questions, sir. Okay, so uh, Facebook viewers, you can send in your questions. We are still with lawyer A's and Koma. I'm excited about the analysis, the historical perspective that um, our learned lawyer, I was going to say my learned friend, I would have been, uh, uh, <laughs> I would have been taken to court. Yeah, uh, 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 you, are, you are learned and you are my friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, our learned lawyer had, um, I mean, the analysis has been amazing, amazing. Most of us, I guess, we haven't looked at it from this perspective. Bishop, Bishop Ben Salah, who is a theologian in the UK, is watching. Bishop, send in your questions. Um, guys, send in your questions. But I'm going to ask it. Um, so Pilate's wife had a dream, which also influenced Pilate's earlier decisions. Uh, how, how does superstition play a role in legal judgment? I'll tell you what, it, has, it, it should have no role. In fact, our laws say that we do, we do not recognize superstition in our courts. Um, yeah, but, and so it is not supposed to be that. But there's also an aspect of the law which says that the law is what the, the, um, the judge had for breakfast. In other words, although the judge is not supposed to be influenced by some of these things, because they, we all are human beings, they might have been raised under circumstances where they believed in some of these things. And so it could happen that a judge could be influenced by factors other than the law. But that is why the, the legal structure is in this way. Often the trial is before one judge, but there's an appellate process that takes you before three. It is believed that if one makes a mistake, the three will probably get it right. And then there's a further process that takes you to five and maybe even to seven. And so you are given several bites at the same cherry, you know, to get it right. But uh, judges are supposed to be influenced by the law and the law alone and nothing else. And if Pilate was in the position of a judge, he would have had this conviction, this conviction over 10. He himself might have lost his position. Caiaphas would have been sacked anyway, right, from when he tore off his clothes. I mean, he made himself mute in presence, in presence of people. I mean, a judge who does that will be picked up and sent to the asylum the next day, you know. But you're right. Superstition is not supposed to play a role. We are supposed to use the law and the law alone. But I, like I said, because we are human beings, we are, we are sometimes influenced by factors other than the law. But that is why the law has an appellate process so that 
a judge's decision can be checked on uh, in the appellate process to make sure that what comes out is the law and nothing but the law. Fantastic. Fantastic. How did public opinion also influence the judgment? Because this it does. It does. It does. Public opinion is, 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 is a very strong factor. It is not supposed to influence opinions, but the reality is that sometimes it does. That is why in certain countries, when a jury is appointed and the matter they are trying is of a lot of, a lot of um, public interest, the jury is then literally locked up, sequestrated. They are not allowed to go home or watch TV until the trial is over so that they are not influenced by the discussion that takes place. So public opinion is, supposed, is not supposed to have an influence, but, the, but we all know that sometimes and often it does. While Jesus was in, was in custody, they made mockery of him, they tortured him, they beat him, they bribefolded him according to Luke 22, 63 and 64. Um, they make mockery of him, insulted him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In today's terms, that could not have happened if you had a client who came to court um, the next day and had his, but you see bruises on his bodies and other things. What would you have done? The first thing, especially under consider dispensation, is that I'll, I'll, I'll ask the I'll ask the court to investigate. Now, if um, if he had signed any confession statements after or in the course, or even leading to the, to, 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 to the torture, the court will hold what is called a mini trial, a voir dire, and determine that this confession statement was extracted either with threats or beatings, and so it will be thrown out of the trial, right? That is having been, the, the confession has been extracted, illegally extracted from the person, but it creates a course of action against the Republic that you can actually sue the Republic and that is why we saw what happened with um, in the, what is going on in the United States with Chauvin, that he beat a man either who was who was in custody. This was similar to what they did to Jesus. It's just that this man died before he went. He, he could put on trial for whatever offense there is, and his family is suing the Republic. And we understand that they are settling the family from with millions of dollars. And the officer who was who was engaged in it is facing trial. That is, that is what will happen under, or should happen under our current um, constitutional dispensation. And I have known instances where the police have been taken to task. I, I did a case. You might think it's the same thing. Same, same, same. The police were to invite my client to the police station. When they got there, he was not there. But the person who had reported said, no, he's hiding in the room. So that person and the policeman broke into the room. And of course, the gentleman was not there. The result was that we sued the states. One, breaking and entering. Two, trespass to property. Three, and they said around the rooms. So we said trespass to chattel. And the court upheld that the police was, was liable for wrongful entry into our property, trespass to land, trespass to, that's trespass, trespass to property, trespass to chattel, etc. And we were given damages. So the state paid us money for the policeman entering into our room and searching the premises. There's law. The problem, however, in Ghana is that often we don't have the time and the patience and the fortitude to fight the law to its logical conclusion. But merely entering a room without a permit, without a, a warrant, a, and, not, and with no evidence that he suspected the person was hiding in there because the lights were off, it was at night. His only say so was the person who said, oh, no, Oshaho, let's open. And they opened and he wasn't there. The state paid damages to my clients. What would have been your legal strategy if you were actually defending Jesus? Uh, <laughs> no, but also for look at how many times he was found not guilty. Yeah. Look at how many times the the, the evidence. No, no, look, even the first trial was paid for with a bribe. I don't know about the appellate process, but the, the proof of a judge and a system being bribed is enough to throw away the, to throw out the conviction, or at least to order a retrial. So even without a lawyer, look at the number of times. So first of all, Caiaphas's court found him guilty, but that whole guilty process, Caiaphas was conflicted. They, clearly, they didn't invite all the members of the of the Sanhedrin to sit. Then look at how many times. Uh, Pilate himself found him not guilty and proclaimed him not guilty. And so even without a lawyer, 
Jesus was himself the best one. Sometimes his silence led to the not guilty uh, uh, you know, proclamation. And so over and over again, he was found not guilty. So really, he didn't, he didn't even need someone like me. He had his own strategy, and the strategy worked very well. And we as lawyers can learn from the strategy. I'm saying that, look, Jesus was a master of sarcasm. Let me put it in three. Master, I got no to work for power. <laughs> I mean, you learn his quick, his quick retorts. It showed yeah. that he was very learned. Yeah. He was widely read. Yeah. He knew how to argue. And he could argue for Pilate to get exasperated. I think that instead of me thinking I could defend Jesus, maybe Jesus can teach me things to do as a lawyer. At, at 33, he was such an amazing man whose ideologies and philosophies uh, actually influence the whole world. What a man that worked on the you, you, you are right. And I think some, often what we miss out is how obviously widely read he was. Now, look, the parables he told, he did not invent the parables. Those were parables that were told in the time, but he took them and turned them into something else and made them relevant. So the depth of his reading, look, there's, he says, um, treat others as you want to be treated. Do unto others as you want others to do unto you. Now, the Hammurabic code, which existed before his time, had a similar statement. He said, do not do unto others what you want others not to do unto you. It might be coincidence, but yeah. it suggests that this was a man who was very widely read. Remember that as a kid, he could debate the priests in the temple into a draw game. Yeah, he was just a kid. Yeah. So yes, he must have had divine um, knowledge, but clearly he was read. He spent those 30 years preparing himself for three years. You know, he ministered for a tenth of his life, but he spent 30 years preparing to work for three years. And maybe the, sometimes that is the, the fault of a lot of us. We, we, we blow them too quickly. We must learn, prepare, and study before we step out there. And when he stepped out there, that man had things to say. And a lot of it, clearly, he read, he knew the customs of the people and could, and could apply it. Amazing, amazing. Um, Ni Abe, Ni Anakwe Abe said, what was the significance and the meaning of Pontius Pilate washing his hands after, washing his hands off after pronouncing his guilty verdict? <laughs> it's strange. I'm, 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 sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure some of those of you who have been to theological school can answer that better. But... But it, it was, it, it's, it's a symbolism that now when you wash your hands, and we all know these are the days of Corona, you are washing death of your hands. It was, a sim, it was a symbolic representation that have I in any way sold my hands through this process by washing it, my hands are clean. But was it legal? Simply washing your hands doesn't mean anything. You have participated in a trial that had proclaimed the man not guilty several times over. Now you proclaim him guilty and then wash your hands. Jesus wasn't executed by the Jews. Jesus was executed by the Roman soldiers whom only Pilate could have ordered. So what did he seek to gain by washing his hands? It was just an empty ritualistic um, um, uh, 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 symbolism that meant nothing and doesn't, uh, you know, and, and, and doesn't absolve him of guilt at all. Yeah, so he was just practicing a, a Jewish um, religious belief that to declare yourself innocent of another man's blood, you wash your hands. And so <laughs> that is what he did. <laughs> okay, um, um, the sins, the bishop, please ask lawyer to comment on Jesus' says answer during the trial. Adi Chiki, yeah, 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 lawyer has spoken about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, you, you can call them cheeky, but they were very, whatever they were, they gave Pilate a lot to think about. And this is the point. He spoke only when he thought there was a need to speak. That's why when he went before Herod, he said nothing. Because as far as he was concerned, what was happening before Herod was a fast that I should do a miracle for you to see. You think I'm some toy? So he said nothing. And even before Pilate, he was careful when he spoke. And when he spoke, his answers were pithy. He just didn't want what from Kekel. There was substance in it, and it yielded a result. Caiaphas tore his clothes off. Somebody slapped him before Pilate. 
Every time Jesus gave an answer, Pilate was confused. So, so he would have been a very good client for you under 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 um, cross examination or whatever it is. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, two known clients. Pa, yes, 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 yes. This is a client who can do his own case. He doesn't need me. He just he just needs me to appear for for its own sake. Yeah, they, we know we know those kinds of clients. They know their case better than us. <laughs> Was the timing of of the trial appropriate? And why were they hasty to pass judgment on the day of Passover? Was there a reason or just because they were meant to fulfill prophecy? Philip, well, well, it, it could be both, but I read that, and, and I didn't intention bring it in because I didn't have enough time to study the exact um, um, Talmudic Tal Tal scripts. But I, I read a line which said that they cannot proceed at night mm -hmm. and before um, a holy, the Sabbath, or a holy feast. That, that, let, let me read what, what, I, what I copied from one of the, the Talmudic scripts. It says that according to the Talmud, quote, criminal processes can neither commence nor terminate, but during the day. And so they needed to wait till the day. But they also, the, the rule was also that you, can, you cannot execute somebody before the feast. Yes, it was a prophecy, but the prophecy coincided with their own desire that we finally have him. If we don't get him killed now, we will lose, we might lose the opportunity to kill him again. We might not get that opportunity again. Let's do it now. But look, we can't do it. Let's push it to Rome or to the secular authorities to do it. So it must have fulfilled scripture. And, and, and then the scripture about him dying at or before the Passover was literally impossible because how could the Jews kill somebody at a time when they knew they couldn't? except if they pass their responsibility on to another institution, which this time was Rome. Now note, even Herod did not kill him himself. He sent him back to, they, 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 Jesus had become like a hot potato. You handle, you can't, you toss to one person, they toss to the other person. So the, the rabbis tossed it to um, Herod, he couldn't handle it. He tossed it to, uh, no, first to Pilate, he tossed it to Herod. Herod tossed it back to him. They tossed it back and forth before he said, you know what? Go and kill him anyway, that's what you want. Amazing, amazing. Um, Benjamin Fetchfair says that very educated, no noise making, highly academic, and evidence based submission. I hope this will be recorded and play on all television stations. I don't know about that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I knew Ace will, will deliver. I knew he will. Okay, so Samnet, Bishop, please. Why was Pilate going to beat Jesus? Would be Jesus a title and release him if he had no sin in him. That's okay. So Sam, can you can you send the question again? I, I guess he's asking why, why 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 would he beat him if the man was innocent? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. You see, the 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 scourging was something that was done before a person was crucified. Hmm. So they would beat you in a sense to weaken you for the crucifixion. Because a crucifixion was a brutal execution strategy where literally your body suffocated itself. And when you were too strong, they broke your legs so you can't resist the death. And the, literally your body's cage will mm -hmm. pull out of your, your elbow and yeah. your elbow will gain about six or seven inches more because your body is suffocating itself. Now, some could die within 10 minutes. Hmm. There are records of, of crucifixion that took four days for the people to die. And ultimately, when the soldiers got tired, they just pierced your heart and killed you anyway so they could go home. And so he had him scourged for that purpose. But for him, it was also to say, look, I've beaten him. Let him go home for free. And sometimes they did the beating as a warning to the person and also to satisfy people. That's why when they caught to the, the, the disciples in the book of Acts, they meant to just beat them and set them free because they, they didn't think they had enough basis to kill them. So the beating was a prelude to killing, but sometimes it was just to warn the person that if you do it again, this time we're going to kill you or to satisfy the, the, you know, the, the, the priesthood class at the time. Bernard Ochre said this amazing presentation. God bless you, Rev and lawyer A. Sankoma. Question, are the accounts of Jesus' trial and crucifixion contained in the Bible history? Remembered and of prophecy historicized. <laughs> Put another way, 
Do the accounts try to accurately describe history, or do they seek to use the life of Jesus to advance a religious movement? Well, uh, uh, this, 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 this is almost a theological question which should come to us. But let, but let, let me say, in, in the, I, I, I did a bit of a religious study. You know that they divide the, the accounts of Jesus, one into the synoptics, Matthew, Luke, and um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then John. Because John wrote from a completely different perspective. Now, these are not four people who sat in the room to write one story. They wrote it from what they had seen, what they had heard, and sometimes they, they were not all present at the same time. In fact, if you look at the trial of Jesus, they, it's as if they tried very hard not to mention any names and a certain disciple. And in fact, one of the disciples was stripped naked after that. Said, no, they didn't say it was a disciple. They said somebody who followed him was stripped naked of his loin cloth. They don't mention the names. But there's harmony in what they say, because at the end of the day, it's a centralized theme. So they wrote from various perspectives and angles. But when you look at when you put them together, they make one sequential theme because some might have heard about it. Some might have been present. And if you know about oral tradition, the more it moves, the more the um, little nuances of it might change. But the central theme, at least from this, remained the same. You know, that, that this, this person said that, the other person said that. And when you read all the four together, you are able to put them together. And now, when, uh, from, from what I learned about and uh, in A-level religious studies is that, especially when you're studying the Gospels, choose one, the synoptics or John, as your central theme, and then build up with the others. So in this, as I said, I started with John as my central theme, and then I built up with stuff that I found in Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke. But it's, it's the whole thing about the perspective they looked at it, but they come into one central theme. Fantastic, fantastic. Obedni Brohim says that, was there a case of double jeopardy since he was whipped and eventually crucified? And why was that possible or allowable in their jurisprudence. Yeah, definitely there was double jeopardy. That's why I record I referred to as the Autry for Acquit. The minute he was acquitted of one, he couldn't be tried under the same circumstances again. In fact, the, the whipping, like I said, was, was not whipping was a prelude to crucifixion. And so often people will be whipped and then crucified because the whipping was to prepare you for the death. So you are not strong enough to resist death when you're hanging on the either the tree or the cross, depending on which one they choose. But the double jeopardy here is that he was acquitted, and as I presented, several times over before he was finally convicted of new words that were thrown in. So it's, this is a simple thing. Whenever Pilate acquitted him, they brought a new charge based on similar facts. Then you acquit him, then they'll bring another one. So finally, Pilate was um, blackmailed into convicting him. So yes, it was not um, 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 double jeopardy. This was probably quintuple or sextuple jeopardy. Wow. So like, last two questions. My, I told my wife, we're going to have these discussions for 45 minutes. Guess what she said? She said, Ace likes talking. You also like talking. You guys cannot do it in 45 minutes. <laughs> well, there, 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 there's something we have in common. That's we right. talk for a living. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you talk for a living. You preach for a living. I talk for a living. <laughs> Amazing. Houston <laughs> um, Emmanuel said Jesus should have been sent to trials during our time for us to defend him in court. Imagine <laughs> legal, atmosphere, legal atmosphere in court. I'm loving no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Jesus, Jesus didn't need me. He was he was his own lawyer. In fact, I, I have to learn from his defense strategies. There's a lot to learn from how learned he was and how he engaged and he knew when to speak and when not to speak. I think that I have way more to learn from Jesus. There's no way I would have succeeded. The man, the man literally succeeded on his own out of field. I, I think I, I probably have flown close. <laughs> <laughs> I think next well, year we should put a drama together titled The Trial of Jesus and probably depend on Ace's uh, legal um, um, understanding to help us really develop a nice script. Yeah, so I'm happy to assist. Well, I have, I have some concluding comments. Uh, if, I, if I if with your, with your permission, I may, I may say that. Well, look, this has been an intellectual exercise, reviewing trial scripts from four different sources. 2,000 years after the fact. It, is not, it wasn't meant to be a comprehensive review. Um, it was just to compare and analyze the scripts 
precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. It does not take away from the heart and the core of the message. In preparing for this, my baby daughter on him has sent me a scripture. She knows her father. She knows I'm going to do all of this intellectual stuff and might forget to put it in proper perspective. So she sent me scripture. And she said that in John 10, Jesus said he would lay his life down by himself and pick it up by himself. He said no one would take it from him. In fact, not Pilate, not Caesar, not the Jews, not the soldiers. He had the power to lay it down and pick it up again. So this was my daughter's message to me, that Daddy, remember that in spite of whatever analysis you do, ultimately, this was Jesus deciding what he wanted to decide. But as I wrote into the night, this was the conclusion that came to me, that in the midst of the lies, the violations, the perjury, and the torture, all of that led to one conclusion. And that is what Herod wrote on the board, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The Lamb of God was born a king. The white man, the wise men traveled to testify to that. He died a king. Pilate, the Jews, the Greeks, the Romans testified to that. He resurrected as a king. The devil and hell testified to that. He ascended into heaven a king. Stephen testified to that. And he will return a king. And at that point, the whole world will testify to it. Paul confirms that he was found in appearance as a man, humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name above every other name, that at the, men that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So by my daughter's leading, I hope I've ended this back on course. This was an intellectual exercise, but it takes nothing away from the central theme and message, which also for and all the pastors preach all the time, that at the end of the day, Jesus laid his life down. No one took his life from him. God bless you. And the Thank previous you, discussion are the things that lawyer Ace and Koma has concluded with. We just wanted to look at the trial of Jesus from with a contemporary lens, but the historical past and the context within which Jesus was crucified will be very important for you to be able to understand it. If you go to Bible school, Bible school will teach you that before you read a book in the Bible, you must know the cultural context within which the Bible, the book was written. You must understand the traditions and the culture of the people to be able to appreciate the, the, the content of the, of the book. This is what lawyer and myself have tried to do. I'm going to ask lawyer the last question. After that, I'll pray and then we go. Lawyer, can you tell us how your relationship with Jesus has helped shape your philosophy, helped you raise your family, etc.? Et well, I, I, I think my, my, my story is always that of the imperfect person striving to walk the walk. But what it has done is that, you know, you know so far, I, I hear it and I know it. It's the near day, do do. I hear it all the time. And then I say, well, imagine what it has been before having been literally dragged in as a kicking and screaming as a preteen, simply because I, I, well, I, I'm, I probably have something, but because I could play, I could play the keyboard at the time. Um, but what it has done is that it keeps, it gives me a grounding, you know, so you are geared to what is moving around you, but you have a foundation that you go out there, you do something and you realize that, oh gosh, I mean, look, it does just fall in line. The, you always have a certain grounding. And so I'm blessed with a family that also believes in that. And like I said, whilst I was preparing for this, it was my daughter who was saying, but daddy, remember that this is not about intellectualism and everything. Go back to John 10 and put your message on that. Why? Because they know me that I can wax unnecessarily intellectual and get into all this analysis paralysis. But, the, you know, I have a family that keeps me grounded. They keep me rooted, you know, and I have very opinionated children and wife. Okay, so we are five opinionated people. We get on like a house on fire. When we get onto the arguments, my wife feels left out sometimes. 
because she's the only one who is not a lawyer among all of us. But then she says, I'm also going to go to law school. I said, baby, you're probably too late for it. But we, we, you know, they, they, they keep me grounded. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to go to law school now, not to practice as a lawyer, <laughs> but to perform a childhood dream. Just, just before I die, I want to be called a lawyer. Why not? So, I might go back to teaching law just because of you. Well, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. So, that, 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 that's the kind of grounding against me. But I'm always going to point out that it is not a soapbox that you mount to say, I do X, Y, Z, and so I'm good and perfect. It is the story of an imperfect man trying very hard through grace to live a certain life, failing 99% of the time, but still fighting and soldiering on anyway, in the hope that the final analysis, it will all be worth it, in the hope, belief, and knowledge that the final analysis, it will be worth it. Fantastic. The whole story of Jesus and his trial, the death and the resurrection of Christ Jesus was all orchestrated by heaven. It was part of God's divine plan for salvation. When man sinned against God in the Garden of Eden, God immediately put in place a redemptive plan. The redemptive plan was made complete when Jesus was crucified on the cross at Gogota. The trial consistently declared he was innocent because no sinner could save sinners. He has, has to take a perfect man like Jesus to die for the sins of the world. Remember, he was described by John that this is the Lamb of God because without the remission, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Jesus is not a religious leader. He is a life-changing spirit. God has set his standard. Man is unable to meet that standard. So God comes to live in you in the form of Christ Jesus, his son, and Jesus meets God's standard through you. If you will ask him to come into your life today and ask him to forgive your sins, he will help you little by little to walk on the path of righteousness. I want to ask you today to give your life to Jesus by praying a very simple prayer. We call it a sinner's prayer. It's less than one minute and let's pray that together. Say these words after me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins and you resurrected for my salvation. I invite you to come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. I ask you for forgiveness of my sins. From today, I want to live for you. So help me to live for you. In your name, I have prayed. Amen. If we pray this very simple prayer, you are born again. Look for a Bible-believing church around your community. To attend. If you visit the Sprinters Road or somewhere around the Sprinters Road, the Pleasant Place Church is always available for you to worship with us. This Sunday morning at 8.45 a.m., I'm speaking on the subject Easter from the Tabernacle of Moses. We are 550 meters from the Kotobabi Junction of the Sprinters Road or the Kotobabi Taxi Run of the Sprinters Road. Jesus loves you. Doc, uh, lawyer, thank you for joining us. And God richly bless you for making time on Holy Saturday to join us. Say thank you to Madame for us for allowing you to join us. I will. God bless you. Bye bye. We'll speak again. It's always a bye joy. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.